Well, hello and welcome to Belong Church to a very special week for us. This is the week that we celebrate our anniversary as a church. And we began our church in 2015. So if you do the math, that means we are seven years old as of this weekend. And what a journey that has been from being at a large local church and hearing the words that they're going to, you know, encourage everyone to find another place to go. And, you know, it's just the end of the road at that point for that particular ministry. And, you know, just all the wrapping up of all of that stuff. And if you haven't heard my story with that, um, honestly thought that we would probably go to another church and just go on staff because that's pretty much what I've done my entire life. And as we were just just continuing on with just closing down the church and busy about, you know, doing, that's a lot of work to close down a church, I tell you. Getting all the logistics done and everything. Um, the Sunday before our last service, um, God woke me up with a dream that we were to plant a church. And I was like, oh God, please no, I don't really want to do that. Um, it was quite stressful. We had an argument back and forth. And, you know, I told God, um, I don't mind being number two, number four, number 500. It doesn't matter what number I am. Just I don't want to be the guy leading the parade. And the Lord really laid on my heart that the last 30 years of me serving in church was for now. And so I called my pastor in Florida, Pastor Tad, and just had this conversation with him. And he prayed about it, and he came back and said, yes, he believed that it was right and that we were right for the the position and you know and it's going to be our spiritual covering which they are to this day and it's just been absolutely wonderful to us we love him a lot so it, it's just been this journey it has not been at all what i thought it would be you know i had in my mind it's going to be like every other church and certainly we don't expect the things that were going to happen with covid and everything else and being a digital only church um before covid we were already set and ready but it's just crazy how the last seven years have played out and where we find ourselves today. And man, who knows where the next year will take us and the next 10 years. I mean, it's just, you know, it's going to be amazing. We are certainly wanting to have a building and a facility and have the plans laid out and hopefully, you know, the next several months be able to get with an architect and actually lay blueprints out so we can, you know, put, you know, you know actions towards that and start working down that thing. And it's just going to be an incredible journey. And, you know, we're still in the jumping off stages of many of the things. But it's just really awesome. And thank you for every one of you that have been here with us for the since the beginning, since, you know, somewhere along the way. And, you know, your faithfulness and loyalty to God is just amazing. And we're just glad that you're taking that journey with us. So today, I want to kind of talk a, a little bit on our anniversary service. I typically want to talk about how we got here. And that's why I prefaced with, you know, the little bit of the story of um, that church closing down and, you know, us getting the, the word from God to do it and the, the, the dream to do it. But prior to that, prior to us even moving to um, Texas when we lived in Florida for 21 years, I've been native Texan, but I went down to help a church in Florida and thought I'd be there for three months and was there for 21 years. Met my wife there. We had our children there and, you know, raised our children, you know, by and large. Um, Andrew was a junior in high school when we moved back, you know, and, you know, they're, they're all pretty, pretty well grown at that point. But prior to that, we were serving in an Hispanic church with my great friend, Pastor Gadana, who's also one of our coverings as, um, as a church. And he was ministering this particular Sunday night, and I just got through leading worship and was just like in the back checking on the technical stuff and making sure everything's going good and just the right way and just working through all that stuff. And I heard him up there doing his message, but it was kind of, I was listening, but I wasn't really listening. It was just kind of like a dull, you know, just I'm hearing the words, but I'm not processing. I'm like, is the recording good? Are we ready for the next thing? We got our slides working, you know, just all the techie stuff. But I heard him say this question, hey, if you went down this certain street, and you saw my truck, which everyone knew what his truck looked like. It was one of a kind. And you saw it at a bar. Am I sinning? And I stopped what I'm doing, and I just looked at him. And, and it didn't say anything out loud, but in my mind, I'm like, yeah, of course, if you're at a bar, of course, you're, you're, come on. I mean, everybody knows that. He continues. He said, if you go down such and such street and you see my truck there, you know it's my truck, but you see that the door's cracked, and you see inside that I'm in there. So someone didn't just borrow my truck am I sinning? And I'm like 
kind of getting more flustered and, and just like, of course you are. Why are you even asking this? I mean, what's this got to do with your message? Then he went further and goes, if you walk down the street, you saw my truck, the door's open, you see I'm in there, and there's, a, there's any kind of a beverage in front of me, am I sinning? And it, it, I'm screaming inside of me, of course you are. Why are you asking these crazy, crazy questions? Of course, I didn't say it out loud. And then he went on to talk about how God has created us to be light in darkness. And then he asked this question, <laughs> still gets me today. He goes, is it possible to be in a place of sin and not sin? That melted my religious brain. I r- pretty much just was like, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, because you want to say yes, but then you're, you're, you have all of these religious thoughts that go through your mind. And he went on to talk about light was created for darkness. And yet so often the church world has just all gone into the same room and like, hey, look at my light. My light's brighter than your light. And, and, we're gonna, and, and it's in the light. And it's like, what's good is it in the light? We're in this um, studio that we prepared here to do all the recording. And there's lights all around me. There's two big ones in front of me, two big ones behind me. I mean, there's a light with the umbrellas. I mean, there's just light everywhere. It's so even. And Michael does such a great job. But if I turn on a little flashlight or, you know, grab my phone and turn on the light here, it's not going to do a whole lot in here because it's bright in here. But when you're in a dark place, that light is going to shine forth greater than anything you've ever seen. In fact, I saw um, an evangelist that lives here locally. He was actually part of the school, Christ for the Nations, when I was a student there. And I've known him through the different years and the different seasons. And he landed out in the DFW at the same time my sister-in-law was and we're waiting. So we walked up and greeted him. It was like, hey, how are you doing? So we just caught up and it's like, hey, what are you doing now? And I just, last time I saw you were at this church and, you know, and we're just catching up. And I said, well, this is kind of where God has me right now and in these places of darkness, you know, by and large. And he got the biggest smile on his face and he said, I found that light works best in darkness. I walked away from there going, wow, that is very, very profound. But now, what is the purpose of that light but just to shine a light and show, hey, there is a different way that you can live your life. So in the different places that we find ourselves, where I find myself and wherever you find yourself, it is possible to be shining your light for God in these places that maybe you would feel people and the places are far from God. There's a famous quote that's attributed to Francis of Assisi. And then I was reading online, and some people say he never said it. And I think, I've heard that he said it, so I don't know. But I love the quote anyway. And the quote is this. Preach the gospel at all times. Use words when necessary. And that just kind of makes me just pause and think, particularly now as it comes to having a light that's shining into darkness, how is it that I, as a Christian, as a Christ follower, not even as a pastor, but just as a Christ follower, how is it that I can let my life preach the gospel without even using a word? You see, that's the problem. I think that so much of the hypocrisy and all the things that have gone on is people in the church, religious people are shaking their finger and say, well, you got to fix this and you got to do that. And you got to do all these things when, you know, you can easily see things that aren't perfect in their lives. And I still maintain that everyone knows when they're making mistakes. Everyone knows when they're sinning and just having someone just point out your flaws and your, and your shortcomings is not going to make anybody happy whether that's a husband or a wife or a friend or a a brother or sister, you know, any of those things. No one likes to hear that, and especially because you already know it. But I I love this story in the Bible, and it's not the one I preached on our opening service, but it's one that's really akin to it. And it's certainly one that I love. It is found in John chapter 4, and we're actually going to read it. And I was planning on just telling the story very quickly as as I typically do. And man, there's just so much in this I want you to see. So if you have your Bible, if you'll open up with me to John chapter 4, reading from verse 7. is the story of the woman at the well. 
Now, let me just play, pay a little bit of context here. Jesus is coming from a ministry trip. He's going from point A to point B. In fact, if you look at the geographical um, thing in the map, where he is is here, where he's going is here, and the straightest point is a straight line in between them. And yet, the sh- between there is Samaria. And the Jews didn't like Samaria. They hated them. It was like, you know, this rivalry going back all these years and all this stuff. And so what most Jews would do is they would take this huge journey up around and come back so they didn't have to go through there. I mean, take three times the length of time. And so Jesus, we said, we find here in verse 4, it says he's very weary from his journey. And he goes, hey, guys, we're just going to go straight through. Now, it wasn't forbidden land. It's just they didn't like each other. And it's not fun to be in a place where nobody likes you and, you know, you, you've got animosities with, you know, the different countrymen. And so they're going straight through and they come to this well that Jesus is tired. So he just kind of says, hey, I'm just going to sit here and rest because I'm, I'm weary. I'm really tired. Aren't you excited like I am that it shows the vulnerability of Jesus as a man? Because there's plenty of times that I'm pretty wearied from my week, from the, just the hustle and bustle of everything that's going on. And it's great to see that Jesus said, hey, I got to take a time out. I'm just going to sit here on this rock and I'm just going to wait. And he sent his disciples into town to buy some food and to get some supplies. And he goes, hey, I'm not even going to walk with you. I don't even have that much energy. I'm just going to stay here. He's kind of chilling. Okay, and that's when we pick up in verse seven. A woman from Samaria came out to get some water. Now, the backstory of this is the women are the ones who would go out and get the the water in the big pots, and they would carry it back and forth. But they would go usually early in the morning and sometimes late at night. But the timing that she's there is in the middle of the day, which is not the normal time. It's been speculated as we read more into her story and find out what you know, her life has been, that she's doing that at a time when no one else is going because she doesn't want any attention. It's speculated that she just kind of wants to be alone and get her stuff done and just kind of like leave everybody else alone. So here Jesus is, and he says to her, will you give me a drink? Because his disciples had gone into town to buy some food. I already said that. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? See, there's that rivalry going on. And she said, she said this because the Jews don't have anything to do with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, you do not know what God's gift is. And you do not know who is asking you for a drink. Because if you did, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Verse 11, she says, sir, you don't have you, you don't have anything to get water with. In other words, there isn't anything in your hand. How in the world are you going to get water that's maybe deeper than what I know? You know, I mean, this isn't making any sense. Of course, Jesus is speaking metaphorically, and she's taking him literally. She goes on to say, the well is very deep. And where do you even get this? Where can you get this living water? I almost hear sarcasm in her statements, but maybe that's just me, and I kind of think sarcastically. She goes on, our father, Jacob, gave us this well. See that little jab? You know, that rivalry back and forth. He drank from it himself. So did his sons and his livestock. Are you more important than he is? Wow, shots fired. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Isn't that true? Every time you get a glass of water, and you consume it, it's great, and it's life for your body, but you're still thirsty another time. He goes on, now he's jumping back and forth between metaphors and actuality. He says, but anyone who drinks the water I give them will never be thirsty. Now he's not talking about an actual water that you can buy at the store. It's not the smart water or the Jesus water, you know, with his little, you know, logo imprinted on it. No, he's talking about the water of life that's inside of you and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. He says, in fact, the water I give them will become a spring of water in them and it will flow up into eternal life. In other words, it's going to give you life all the time forever, not even while you're on this earth, but forever in eternity. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water. Then I will never be thirsty. I mean, she's still in the practical thinking, hey, 
I mean, this would be great if I don't ever have to drink water again. Look at what she says then. And then I won't have to keep coming to get here to get water. She's thinking so practically, hey, I don't really like coming here anyway because all the women, you know, they're running their mouths, they're gossiping. Hey, if you give me some water, I don't have to come back here. That just works out really good for me. And he told her, now this is where Jesus is, is twisting this story, man. He's throwing her a curveball here. He said, okay, go get your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not even your husband. So what you have said is very true. Now, pause there. Can you imagine? See, that's why I believe she's coming out and it's speculated that she's run through five different husbands and she's now living with some other guy that they're not even married. She's the talk of the town. So maybe it's X of husband one, two, three, four, or five, and all their family, and rant, 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 rant. And here she is just, you know, she's just giving up on life. And so she's just trying to stay under the radar and just stay away from all the women and their gossip and all this stuff. And so she's coming out at this time. And her statement is so very hilarious to me. Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. I mean, he just read her mail. I mean, he just like, boom, 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 boom. He set up the dominoes and then he knocked them down himself, right? Asking her to bring her husband. But she continues on. She's still in this mind that's religious and tripped up. Our people have always worshiped on this mountain. I mean, you've got this guy who just read your mail and you're going to go after some political, um, religious debate back, back and forth. I don't understand that. I would probably do something similar if I was in her shoes though just to be truthful. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Again, hitting that contention between them. Jesus said, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will not worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, and we worship what we do know. Salvation comes from the Jews. He's speaking of himself. He is the salvation, and he is from the Jewish side. But a new time is coming. In fact, it's already here that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. They are the kind of worshipers the Father is looking for. For God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Then the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. And Messiah, of course, means Christ. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. So she's just kind of brushing Jesus off with what his reply is with just this other religious, like, I'm going to just whitewash over all of this stuff. Like, she keeps trying to trump him, like, are you better than Jacob? Are you better? Uh, we do this and we, you do that. And she's just trying to keep doing this stuff. She's kind of arguing with him a little bit. <laughs> and then Jesus said to her, verse 26, the one you're speaking about is the one who's speaking to you. I am he. Jesus is saying, hey, you just trump, tried to trumpet and say, hey, there's a Messiah coming, and I'm just letting you know, I am he. Verse 27, then the Jesus' disciples returned, and they were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want from her? And no one asked, um, what, what are you talking with her? Why are you talking to her? So the woman left her water jar, and she ran back into town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? So then the people came out of the town and made their way towards Jesus. Now that's just a crazy and amazing story to me, that Jesus is just tired. He wasn't planning on having this encounter with her. He didn't have it all arranged. He's just tired and says, hey guys, I really can't even keep going on. I'm going to sit here on this rock. I'm just going to chill for a little bit. Maybe there's a little shade going on here. Y'all go into town, get some food, come back. We'll eat up. We'll rest a little bit more, and we'll continue on our journey. And here comes this woman, and God says to his son, Jesus, hey, this is what I've cut for you today. This is the, this is the mission for you today. And he begins talking with her, and, and what becomes in her life becomes the same. But it wasn't just about the journey. Then she went back, and the entire town came back. And it's said that she was the catalyst for the entire town and region to become to know God and to know Christ and to have truth into them. But let's suppose into her life story just a little bit. 
See, Jesus called her out that she'd been married five times before, and the man you're with, living with now isn't even your husband. So there are at least five stories. There are five failed marriages there. My wife loves to say that everyone has a story. This woman has five stories, okay? And then she's li living with this other woman, I mean, li living with this other man, so she's now got a sixth story at least minimum, right? I mean, this is just crazy. As I've said, it's likely that she went to the well at this time just to avoid all of the other women. And as a result of an inappropriate conversation, because women weren't supposed to talk to men or men to women, and Jesus wasn't really technically supposed to be there because, you know, this is a place the women went. It's kind of, you, you shouldn't be there. So she had this conversation that was inappropriate, and it, it, Jesus had an inappropriate conversa location culturally with an inappropriate person, not even from her, her countrymen, you know, that they are an animosity, but yet her life was changed forever. But not only hers, but the whole town came out and lives were changed as a result of her. Now imagine her coming home that night. Imagine as she lay her head on her bed and she's contemplating how her life had changed in one day because she met the man named Jesus. Nothing had changed in her life until she came in contact with him. In fact, her life is just pretty much going to be just the same, just, you know, boring, you know, living life. Just the next day is like the last and, you know, there's not much hope in the future, okay? She's just trying to exist. Can I tell you the same thing is true for you? Your life can be changed today by the same man named Jesus. Today can be your day. See, I'm fairly confident that most people had written her off in that town. She had likely even written herself off. She thought that there's no hope. I've just had too many failures. I've had too many failed relationships. And yet, Jesus. Will you bow your heads? When you think that there's no other hope, when you think that there's nothing else there for you. Too many mess ups. Too many I wish I could go back and fix. Too many skeletons. I mean, she had five failed relationships. We don't know if she had children through all those. I mean, there's just so many questions we don't know. And yet Jesus came and her life was changed forever. And that same thing is available for you and for me. So I want to make this opportunity for you and offer, as I do it at the end of every message, on purpose, I want to give you the opportunity to let today be your day. So if that's you, as your heads are bowed, I encourage you to say this prayer after me. Say, Father in heaven, I acknowledge that I am far from you. Right now, I choose to give up doing life my way. I surrender my life to you. I ask you to forgive me for every time I've missed it, for all my failed relationships and failed life tries. And I receive your new life. I give my life to you and I place my trust in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now if that's you, I encourage you to take the next step and that is with us as a church, is to simply text the word CONNECT to 469-1114. It's not about joining our church. It's simply letting us know that you pray this prayer, and we'll be able to communicate with our text communication system of what your next steps could be if you'd like to take them. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for seven years as a church. Lord, I thank you for the vision that you've placed inside me. And Lord, as we continue to try and walk pleasing to you and, and to do the things you have and to walk into the places that are dark, walk into the places that are lit, to let our light shine everywhere. And Lord, even as we talked about that quote, no matter who said it, that we're going to preach the gospel with our lives everywhere and use words when necessary. Lord, let our light so shine, our life so shine, that people will be drawn to you. Father, I give you all the glory for what has been Belong Church and what it will be and where its future is. Lord, in spite of all my shortcomings, you still use me, and I'm humbled by that. 
Lord, I thank you for everyone who's taken this journey with us, with me and Lenore. Lord, that the, the people who are sowing into this financially and, and paying their tithes and offerings, Lord, and, and reading their Bible and praying and watching the messages and telling people and, Lord, just letting our light shine wherever we are. Father, speak a blessing over all of them. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us on our, our anniversary service for our church. Seven years. woo Now watch the end for ways you can connect. You can find us on social media and ways to give.